on your behavior, it's on your heart, it's on your DNA. Like, how do you, how do you deal with all that? Tiffany, I think it was you that I read where your studies include examining and understanding students who are searching for love and hope. Yes. Oh, my mic is on. <laughs> yes, I didn't put that in my bio, but I'm glad that um, made it. I think I, as a teacher at Leadership High School, uh, we carry a, a, both the ethnic studies model, but also we incorporate what a Nancy Krieger, epidemiologist uh, Nancy Krieger identifies as an eco-social model, where we're not just looking at, um, we're, we're transcending the blaming of children for what they're experiencing, um, but we're also taking it a little bit step, uh, another step further than from what uh, neuroscientists, when they're asking what has happened to you, we're also seeking to understand who and what is responsible for what's happening to you. So if our young people are um, experiencing pattern forms of uh, stressors or chronic, chronic stress, who and what is responsible for that? Whether it's their poverty that we have control over, um, whether it's the racism and discrimination that they're experiencing, we seek to give young people the tools to investigate the causes of their stressors, um, but also giving them the tools to disrupt them. And what we found um, uh, by a study of, uh, from Arlene Geronimus, she looked at weathering on people's bodies, the wear and tear, and that some of the most successful people, black women in our society with high incomes and uh, great degrees, these women are still having high rates of infant mortality. They're, they're dying early. And so we have to even be careful with our honoring and praising of young people who, are, who have high achievement in the midst of adversity because the discrimination, the adversity that they're experiencing in our society still is wearing and tearing on their bodies. And so our models, our ethnic studies models, our eco-social models are looking at ending the causes of the discrimination because what we know about, there's one thing to have exposure to trauma, but we also have to have conversations around the ways in which our young people embody trauma, the ways in which the inequality and the discrimination that they experience literally gets under their skin. Right, and so we both are giving young people the tools to critically investigate it, um, to disrupt it, but we're also very, it's a lot happening while I'm preaching. Um, <laughs> but we also are seeking to gain partnerships with the most powerful in our society in that uh, we tend to often expect the most from those with the least power. And so we, while we give our young people the critical tools to investigate their lived experiences, we also are seeking to speak truth to power and expect much from those who have the ability to actually disrupt these causes of their trauma. Well. I like hearing from you because you're involved in that is, can, are, well, is anybody doing something about it? That's part of the answer to that question. So let's turn to another end of the table. Where is anybody doing something about it? And apparently from the applause out here, you might be that person. <laughs> well, that, that was appropriate, and I thank you all for that, because Third Street started off as the Bayview Healing Arts. How many people remember that in here? And I thank you, because it started as a community effort, right? So we are known as the most resilient neighborhood in San Francisco, right? Thank you, okay, yes, <laughs> right? And it started, Third Street started in 2005 as a community effort and an effort amongst young people. So like she was just saying, really trying to empower young people to take ownership of what's happening to them. And when the community came together, we said we want a safe space for young people to just explore some of the loss that they're experiencing, explore some of the grief, um, some of the anger around the violence that's going on and express it in a, a healthier way. So we started off as using art as a healing modality. And then young people said, you know what? We need some health services. We need something where we can come in and get checked out for um, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, and so then we started the clinic side of it, right? Again, this was from the word of the community and the word of the, the young people. 
Um, we also added be behavioral health services, so we always had like a therapist um, on staff. And one of the things that we continue to see is that youth are experiencing grief but don't know how to deal with it, right? Because it happens so often. So the day that they go and get that placard or that t-shirt for one of their friends who was killed, the next week somebody else. They gotta go get another t-shirt, another placard, right? And how do we see this playing into our, our part, right? We screen all of our young people. They're using drugs, right? There's a, a high amount of self-medication. They're also using sex as a way for self-medicating. We see when um, violence increases, we see a, a spike in our STDs. So how do we give them the tools that they need, like she was speaking about, to, to process these things, right? One being that we give them their space, but the other part is the education part and letting them know that it's okay that, that you're going through this, but it's not okay, right? We're trying to help you get through this and that it, it's, it's not natural. So how do we, how do we continue to, to build up a community that continues to get broken down day after day, week after week? It starts here. It starts with these community efforts of speaking out, speaking out, listening to our young people about what they need to heal. You know, I'm gonna... Uh, pass the mic back down to James there for a second. Because when we looked at the, at, at the film, a lot of the places where you went were small town America. We're now in an urban center where the problems she's describing are se seemingly the same kind of problems those people were describing and confronting. What's happening? Oh, boy. I, I wish I had the answer. I could fix a lot of problems. You, you but, you would know, be on the stage. I, it is... It is um, it, the interesting thing about this science, and I think what I like about the fact that the, when you take, when you administer the ACE test, it's, it's, it's more important to understand what the exposure is as a number or frequency or, or how, how many of these generalized uh, experiences you've been exposed to, it creates sort of a safe, a safe zone because you can, you can say, oh, six is a lot, you know, two isn't great, but six is tough and you know the higher up it goes, the, the, the more there is the risk over someone's life of, of there being problems if it's not uh, mitigated. So that's an equalizer. So when you're in, you know, whether, you know, I, I, another interesting community, I was uh, with the Navajo Nation um, in September, then, you know, the interesting the thing you see there is they look at what you're talking about in terms of the value of community coming together and looking at the child as a holistic being that, that needs help in, uh, at many different layers, family, education, help, uh, that's built into their own spiritual practice that goes back forever. So, you know, they, they could recognize the science and say, wait, this actually looks like our own spiritual practice. So, in, in, when I go to different places, it seems like you know, the good news is that there's a, there's a unique way for each community to attach to the science and, and use it to help themselves. Um, the bad news is this, it seems to be uh, the ACE scores and the, and the problems are prevalent everywhere. I mean, I've never gone anywhere where, you know, uh, people don't stand up afterwards who've hosted a screening, whatever, whatever community, and, and hear stories that, you know, break your heart. And, make you hope the best and, and, you know, hope that they can get the wraparound services they deserve. Patricia, you were, uh, rightly so, proud of the job that you're doing now. In a bureaucracy like this, you have time to digest the findings, you know, the doctor here, or the findings that were coming from, you know, a wonderful vehicle like this documentary. Does it get into the workplace psychology that people are doing these things? Actually, I was thinking of asking you, uh, the experts here, whether in your experience in your travels across the country and across the world, systems are actually implementing the use of the ACE in order to determine the risk factors, but also to link to the appropriate resources and services. Because I can tell you right now, 
That is not happening. Uh, there is not an ACE um, tool that is being used. There's a number of other assessments that are being used that are very lengthy, but this is a very simple and meaningful tool that seems to have yield good results. Um, and I would like to actually think about um, requesting that my social workers, when they're working with the families and, and talking to our children, uh, to our clients, that we start probing a little bit more. And of course you have to develop that relationship, but I, I know that I became acquainted with the ACE when a couple of years ago one of our judges had the brochure from the clinic and she said, this is really great. We really need to implement that. Well, it's two years later and I really appreciate you having this film because it is a power, powerful testament to justice stakeholders and system stakeholders to consider using this. I mean, we pay millions of dollars for these assessment tools, and I question how effective they are. Okay, Lauren, you're on the other side of the bay, but confronting the same kind of problems. You just don't have a good doctor on your team over there like we have over here. But uh, tell us about, you know, what are you all learning from what's being discovered, either through the film and the ACE or through her own personal experiences here. I can certainly imagine um, if our principals and our superintendents started um, the year off by showing this film, what a difference it might make in terms of adding it to our toolkit, um, looking at social emotional learning. Um, I've heard some of the panels talk about reaching students and families, talking about how to teach them to be self-aware, um, to be uh, able to manage their own emotions, um, looking at social awareness, uh, being responsible and making responsible decision making. You know, all of these kinds of stresses and um, triggers are not only with adults uh, or with children, but they're adult to adult. So when we talk about um, Oakland Unified School District, and I dare say San Francisco School District as well, um, looking at teaching different kinds of trauma-informed practices, looking at uh, restorative justice kinds of um, programs when we're making other decisions regardless or instead of being more punitive to our students, instead of suspending students for behaviors, really beginning to coordinate services so that we can look at what the root cause of. Um, California has eliminated, as many of you may or may not know, uh, but suspending students for defiance. So if I tell a student to sit in the red chair and he sits in the blue chair, I can no longer suspend a student for that. But trying to really reach down and understand why is it that the student wants to sit in the red chair instead of the blue chair. Maybe he wants to sit, he or she wants to sit in the red chair because it sparks some kind of a memory, some kind of a trauma that happened. So as we as educators begin to look at routines and rituals and creating safe uh, cultures and environments, we have to really sometimes forego the academic and really look at the heart, look at the student, and take that time and be intentional about that time to really build relationships with students and with their families so that as we know that they may have suffered some kind of a trauma, we can help them through grief and recognize that maybe the elementary school student or the preschool student that is crying, that um, is suffering from um, an, an illness, that we can begin to make home visits and really recognize and understand and interrupt patterns of chronic absenteeism um, and do that kind of work. It's hard work, but it begins right here. Every person in there, you may have a child, you may have a godchild, you may have a uh, sibling. Um, we all want the best for our children, both academically, socially, emotionally, and health-wise. And so for us to have this conversation, for us to be in this space, it makes a difference. So Oakland uh, and San Francisco, we're on the right path because we're doing the hard work. We're having the hard conversations. We're talking about race, class, and culture, and we're making some positive steps. So I can envision having this shown to superintendents all over the nation. It's a movement that needs to be done.